Um, so for those of you who don't already know Scylla, um, Scylla is, is someone who I'm very moved and inspired by. Um, I've gotten to meet you, Scylla, through the Dew School. And, um, and Scylla is a peace builder, um, an author. She's the founder of the Oxford Research Group, um, which was a big voice in bringing, creating dialogue um, between policymakers around nuclear weapons. Um, and de-escalation. She's the founder of Peace Direct, um, which I know has been in, has worked all around the world and including um, within India and Pakistan. Um, so I know you've been an advisor to, you know, other heroes and mentors, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Sir Richard Branson, and, uh, and as you mentioned, your newest book, A Mighty Heart, um, will be a goodie, it sounds like, for everyone who's, who's here. Definitely check that out. Um, and Dr. Manakshi uh, Gopinath, I, I know also that it's a special treat. I see Silla already responding. I, I can tell, you know, your, your friendship and your relationship with each other is so palpable, um, even online. And Manakshi um, is a political scientist, the founder of WISCOMP, um, which I'm sure many of you know, um, but it's really, you know, an influencer in, in South Asian women's leadership, especially around this area of, of international politics and peace building and diplomacy. Um, I know you were also Dean of, of uh, the top women's college and education is near and dear to your heart. Um, and, and I'm familiar also with, with the civilian award, um, as an acknowledgement of your work. So I know that's just a little bit of, of the lifetimes that you both have had, but, um, but yeah, we'll hand it over to you and really looking forward to hearing your, what you think and what you feel and what you envision for women's role in peace. So thank you both so much. Um, thank you, Eva. And, um, uh... Thank you, Ekta, for this uh, path-breaking initiative. Um, you know, it's so invigorating in the company of such amazing women. And um, when I heard the voices that I heard last two panels, it really, literally gave me goosebumps. And Silla has always said that when you get goosebumps, you must recognize that you are in the presence of authenticity. And it gives us uh, so much hope uh, for our future. And, and, and I think in the midst of all the gloom and doom of acrimony that we hear in policy and strategic circles, there is, as uh, Camus once said, need to recognize that great ideas uh, come into the world as gently as doves. And um, if we live attentively, uh, we can hear amid the uproar of empires and nations uh, a faint flutter of wings, which is the gentle stirrings of life and hope. And there's so much hope that these amazing young women have brought to the table. Um, and, and thank you really again, Ekta, for, for reconnecting Silla and me. Um, Silla is my hero in many ways. And uh, the last time we met was a very intense, very intense experience we had when we visited the Chilga of uh, the Sufi saint Nizamuddin Olya in New Delhi. And I will never, I'll never forget how uh, just being with Silla gave me a completely new experience to a place that I had been to several times. Um, you know, Avni mentioned uh, her own uh, views on how conflict is inevitable. Silla reiterates that. And what we are really trying to do is that look at how we can wage conflict non-violently. Uh, because sometimes conflict is necessary for growth in society. It's violent conflict that we abhor. Um, and Silla has also shown me how powerful sisterhood can be. Uh, I have learned much from Silla and her thoughts and insights and writing have inspired my own works with WISCOMP. And over 20 years, WISCOMP has striven to bring young or future influential from India and Pakistan together in conflict transformation workshops, where 
much of what you have said uh, has found deep, deep resonance. We have today about 500 alumni spread all, all over the world, many in India, many in Pakistan, and in the parts of the globe, who really sing a song that resonates for all of us. And the great potential of feminine energy that Silla has spoken to us about this morning or this uh, later this afternoon. Uh, and you know, once Silla told me, uh, Minakshi, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And you know, in many ways, that was what, that was the burden of her song. But I do want to, before I go to Silla with several questions that I have, I did want to highlight that there is something that is not made visible in the meta narratives of peace and security on our embattled subcontinent. And that is that there is a fairly large pulsating constituency for peace that exists here, as you have seen today. And that this constituency is led by women. Uh, and this fact is often inv invisibilized. Uh, and this is what Silla has foregrounded in much of her work on peace. Um, and the other thing I did want to share, and it was, it, was, uh, it was like music to my ears when I heard Moni speak earlier, and many of you uh, res uh, sort of re-emphasize that, that we need to speak more and more in the mother tongue. And, and by that, I don't, I mean the metaphoric mother tongue. I don't mean Urdu or Hindi or English or French. I mean the language of connection and inclusion. The language that is often uh, at the edge of silence, but very often on the verge of song. The language that can make maps change. The language that can speak truth to power that people like Silla and many of you are attempting to do. That language, which is the non sensorian language, the non father tongue, if you want to call it that, it's always on the verge of silence, but it's always on the verge of song. And that is that everyone who wants to sing will find their song. And that is the song that we heard today. And it's sung through art, it's sung through literature, it's sung, sung through music, film, design. And the whole efflorescence of that song is what we need to hear more and more and what needs to pulsate for all of us. And there are so many women from both sides of what you call the border whose work I've admired, some of whom I know personally, uh, and who, whom I, some, many of whom I'm meeting again for the first time who fill me with so much hope. Now, Silla spoke about the various attributes uh, of, of peace builders, empathy, compassion, deep listening, intuition, interconnectedness, inclusivity, and regeneration. And that has to somehow reach the highest levels of policy. And you know, it reminds me of a little story and, and, and uh, I won't take much time. Um, Joe Velikoff, who was once a, uh, a sort of air engine mechanic in the Second World War, and she gave it all up then later to join the peace movement uh, through her Quaker path, had this to say. Um, I, when I look at the words women, peace, and power, I let these words joggle around at the back of my head, uh, hoping that they would fall very neatly in place uh, and establish a clear relationship between them. But this did not exactly happen. When I first brought them forward, women, peace, and power, and put on my glasses to look at them, I found that the word peace, in juxtaposition with the word women, took on a sickly, flat, grayish, pink color. Very innocuous and very ineffective. The word power, on the other hand, turns black and scarlet, threatening and sinful by association with women. And then when I move the word woman off to stand by itself, a peculiar ill-shaped question mark hung over it. But very soon I discovered that the problem lay with the spectacles that I was wearing. And then I needed to change my lenses. 
And that's precisely what Silla is urging us to do. Because today the word peace is not the conventional association of the woman in white, the Florence Nightingale sort of figure, peacefully holy and wholly peaceful. These are women who are able to recognize that a stable situation is not necessarily a peaceful one. It's not necessarily a just one. And, and therefore, sometimes one has to rock the ship of the state. As Rosa Parks did, for example, way back in Alabama, when she refused to be, uh, to be thrown off her seat because it was her dignity and sense of justice that kept her there. And then she lit the fuse for social dynamite. So the women who build peace today are disobedient women. They're difficult women, but they are there up there in the front lines, like the ones in the Greenham Commons who pinned diapers on missile fences, the women, the mothers in Argentina who processioned to, uh, to seek uh, the return of their sons who were imprisoned, the women in black, the Jerusalem link, a whole array. There's been an efflorescence of women building peace on several fronts across the world. But you know what? Their work has been invisibilized. Still people like Silla Kim to, hide, to, to shine the light on them and to say, look, they have a voice. They have something to say. Listen to them. And that was, I think, somewhere the recognition that women do speak in a different voice. We're not essentializing this. We're not recognizing. We're not saying men make war and women make peace. But women do speak in a different voice. And in a sense, that was really the beginning of rising women and rising world with Silas Fokar, which Moni alluded to, about concerns about across not just politics, but economics, the environment, uh, taking responsibility, taking collective responsibility. And one of the things was to do in our workshops was to recognize differences and build on commonalities. Yes, we are similar people, but in India, we often make the mistake of saying we are the same people, we are not. Pakistan is a state. It has, a, it, it, there is a tremendous respect for that state. It was born in 47. It has a distinctive identity. While acknowledging that there are differences, but there are commonalities. And that how we search for common ground as our common friend, Susan Colin Maas has taught us, and she's an, another amazing woman. There is national pride, and yet there are these connections which we need to. And between India and Pakistan, as we know, there is a complex amalgam of emotion. There is uh, curiosity, there is nostalgia, yet there is suspicion, uh, there is uh, wonderment, there is a desire to know more. And that's what we really want to pin and peg this peace building initiative on. And thank you so much for doing this for all of us, for humanity. So Sila concentrates on aspect of peace building, which is very often neglected. It's what I call the software of peace building, the inner work that she likes to foreground. And in her book, Tools for Peace, she wrote for the World Peace Partnership, and it's an invaluable little toolkit. It's like a Bible that I use very often. Uh, she had talked about this yin intelligence. At that time, she hadn't called it so. But it, it combined an amazing set of spiritual resources, very much like Aikido, uh, very much like a kind of spiritual jiu-jitsu, where she said, get perspective, speak person to person, really listen. I think she talked about active listening today give voice to feelings, work to the, together to identify common ground, show respect because humiliating the other is a sure recipe for distance. And we need multi-lobes. We don't just need that, we need multi-lobes. And the more the multi-lobes, the better chances there are of creating an efflorescent a platform of engagement or platforms of engagement. And we really need in the South Asian context to acknowledge our own ambivalence to violence. Despite the Badshah Khans, despite the Gandhis, we have this deep-rooted ambivalence to violence and we can't push it under the carpet, just as we can't push the horrors of partition under the carpet. 
on the fact that our history textbooks are full of heroes and villains constructed to reinforce stereotypes. So how do we get beyond them? So Silla, I know that you believe with Helena that no pessimist ever discovered the secret of the stars or opened a new heaven to the human spirit. So may I ask you that what, when you were talking about RWR, Rising Women, Rising World, as sculpting uh, what could be possible, and you talked about that in your book about imagining the possible, uh, looking at the future as something that is filled with abundant thinking and moving away from the temperament of scarcity. What is it that you really meant? And what is your recipe for women building peace? Or what are the ingredients that women peace builders need to bring to the fore? Thank you. I'm sorry I took so long that introduction. I can never stop talking when I see you. <laughs> I'm relaxing my respect for you cannot be measured because you've blazed the trail long before most of us started and what you've done in bringing together uh, youth particularly youth talented youth from india and pakistan together i've witnessed what you did i've witnessed the dynamics in that large room with all those young people and it was stunning um, and uh, I, I, while, while we've been talking, while uh, this whole engagement of so many talented women has been unfolding in the last hour, and hour or two, I couldn't help <clears throat> writing down without anticipating your question at all, um, what it is we might be able to do together. Because the skills on this call, and we haven't even heard from all of them yet, the skills are absolutely phenomenal. Experience, talent, uh, in the arts, in every kind of uh, investigation into what is needed for peace. Um, and so um, I I'll try and answer your question by thinking, first of all, what's the basic premise that we need in work for somebody very early on today said the possible strategy for a south asian union or unity i was fired by that and i started weaving first of all what would be the basic premise it would be women and men drawing on yin intelligence and having the values and the vision to um, build bridges of understanding starting with India and Pakistan and maybe extending to a South Asian Union in the future. So what would be the initial vision and who could develop it? What are the stages necessary, including the skills to change perspectives, um, including caring communication, including ways of transforming the opposition and enabling this huge constituency that we've tapped into this morning to actually engage actively. So we need, obviously, the skills to change perspectives about the other. That all, all the things we've talked about, listening, nonviolent communication, dealing with anger and projection, developing self-awareness, and taking a stand on the issues that matter to us without provoking more opposition. And in what ways could the arts that we've heard so much from the, those skilled in the arts, how could they take these skills out to more people through theater, music, video, literature, programs for children, even the proposed artist's residency in the palace. And then how do we develop these caring communications, deeply nonviolent, people-friendly, human-centered ways of engaging large numbers of people with the vision once it's outlined. 
And then we go on to things like actually transforming the opposition, mapping out those with whom it's important to communicate, train and organize our ambassadors with the skills of developing understanding. And many of those ambassadors are those who are here on this call. And then enabling this huge tide of engagement, which could then arise, gathering and harvesting the skills of people, the skills of all those on this amazing call, to a strategy that would work. What's the role of Ishi in this? And going on to sharing the experience with enablers and challengers and how to get this funded lastly. So, I mean, actually that's a bit of a longer answer than you bargained for, but um, you, you, you're such a um, inspirer. I can't, I can't stop developing ideas when I'm in communication with you. And that's so like you, Silla, you always give credit where it doesn't belong, but, but I did want to do something from your, uh, your pioneering the possible and where you had said, you know, the master doesn't talk, he acts. In this case, she acts, which is you. When her work is done, you say, amazing, we did it all by ourselves. I think those are the kind of facilitator need for the process. And it struck me that when you talked about the Tao of leadership, one of the things we carried away or took away from our WRW was what seems soft is strong. Uh, water and someone talked about fluidity and fluidity of borders and fluidity of expression that water is fluid and it can wear down the hardest of rock because it, it's it is it's moving it's always moving so so if I remember when you conduct that workshop at our uh, conflict transformation uh, get together where there were about two, uh, 30 young people from Pakistan and about 40 from India. It was called the software of peace building. And one of the things you did talk about then, you alluded to it, uh, uh, was yin and yang. And I just thought I would share with you our takeaways from what you had taught us then. Mm. Uh, one was this whole issue of the yin and the yang, the both sides of the brain, both sides of the emotions, but also the need to recognize the difference between Kronos and Kairos, to know the twin nature of time, that some things are in the long term, some things immediate, calendar, clocks, and so on. And the peace builder needs to know when to time what. Maybe times when you have to, to be a little below the radar to be more effective. Uh, the second thing was, and this is my takeaway from that, how women peace builders need to know serendipity, synergy, and synchronicity, that things happen serendipitously, as happened to you when Kuan Yin answered your prayer when he was with a nuclear scientist, the Chinese, and how this non-linear thinking is about a leap of faith, which many of our young participants today highlighted, how you just have to make that leap of faith, that trust building is so important interconnectedness which you said which is so important but also the ability to step into the space of complexity not black and white be open uh, reach out to those who fear you fear the most reach out to those who somehow defy labeling and you can't quite understand um then of course like meditation uh serene encounter with reality to be able to know what where you stand, know the facts, as you said, understand the facts, and don't just base it on opinions. As our, our, our artist from who's been investigating temples uh, in Pakistan has been doing. And of course, the openness to flow, the ability to step in the shoes of the other, and to continuously know the link between what you're doing here, acting globally and also acting locally, thinking globally, thinking locally, and to always maintain the link with the universal. I mean, consecrate every act to that larger peace building canvas and know that 
every act of uh, resistance and and uh, whatever your multiple resistances and your everyday everyday mutinies are consecrated to something much larger and of course we as women must understand the, the nature of patriarchy and how we are complicit sometimes in it without even knowing it women in south asia face a continuum of violence of, of, of exclusion, not necessarily overt, but of exclusion, of injustice. And last but not least, to highlight what you say, breaking out of victimology, we need to break out of this terminology of being victim and enjoy, or, or shall I say, embrace the joys of agency. So Silla, how do you, you know, you, you've told us so many personal stories about um, the qualities of agents of transformation. For example, how resolution, someone spoke about conflict resolution earlier, how resolution is different from transformation. We talked about conflict transformation. You know, your experience with the TRC incident in South Africa, when this young man wanted to be, meet the mothers of his victims. Uh, then at the Oxford Research Group, how the nuclear scientists felt the vibration of the meditators from below the, the floor. Aung San Suu Kyi uh, displayed tremendous serenity where she had conquered fear and how she was able to avoid a bloodbath. How Colonel Chris Hughes was able to avoid a bloodbath in, in Iraq because he had respect for the seeming adversary and empathy and listening and ho'oponopono and all of that is something like, you know, because we all agree that the true voyage of discovery is in having new eyes, not seeking new landscapes, having new eyes. So it's a particular experience that you would like to share, which was in some senses, as Ekta said, meeting you was, was for her a life-changing experience. Among all those amazing experiences, which really, which particular one would you like to share with us today? If there was time, I'd request you to share all, but if there's one that you'd like to leave us with as a message for women peace builders on the subcontinent. Oh. And know the fact that uh, there are about 98 Nobel Peace Prize winners and only 17 are women. Mm -hmm. And after th this millennium, the work of people like you has enabled more women's work to be recognized. We have seven Nobel Peace Laureates among women uh, up until 2020, because you said we can't invisibilize their work anymore. People like you have said. So would you like to share a story which we, which we as women ostensible striving for peace on our continent can hold close to our hearts and say, hey, this is possible. This can happen. We've got to believe in miracles as Shimas Hini told us. I would like to share a story about energy because it is the energy of inner power which is going to change things. Uh, this is what's coming up, I guess, and I think many people on this call guess as well. It's, um, it's an energy coming up from below. It's no longer our leaders who have any monopoly on wisdom, particularly in my own country and in the United States at the moment, our leaders are bewildered, uh, incapable, and have no um, map of how to proceed. Whereas what I notice, and I'm sure you do too, and many people on this call have spoken about it, is what's coming up from below, from the grassroots, from young leaders, from particularly women leaders, is common sense, nonviolence, and a plan of how the future could be. Um, and I believe that that is an energy that is not just undeniable at the moment, but it is going to be the energy of the future. And I'd like to tell you a quick story about my own experience of it, which was with a man. And the man happened to be Nelson Mandela. So forgive me for that. Um, and it was <clears throat> back in uh, the early days of our formulation of the elders. That was a group of men and women 
who were to be the elders of the global village. The idea was originally of um, a musician and he took it to Richard Branson and Richard Branson said, let's take it to Mandela and Mandela got involved. Um, and uh, so did I. And this meant that I, I think it was the second time I met Nelson Mandela and he walked into a room leading heavily on Peter Gabriel's arm. He was 89 by this time. He sat down and he started to talk. And there were about 60 people in the room. And Mandela has a raspy voice. He's not an orator. He doesn't do flourishes. Um, but when he started to talk, I got goosebumps, just what you're talking about. And I th after 35 minutes, when he finished speaking, I still had goosebumps. And I thought, what's going on here? Normally goosebumps last 30 seconds. And I worked it out eventually, it took me a long time. And it was the energy of that man's integrity. That's what took him through 27 years on Robin Island without collapsing or dying. That's what gave him the inner power that enabled him and his colleagues on the African National Conference to prevail in dialogue and not civil war to get their rights. And this is the energy of integrity. And we call on our innermost strength, our experience as women, our, our powers that we've not even yet fully used. That's the energy of our integrity that is going to change things. And it's when you meet it, you'll know it. And I've recognized it many times listening to this conference. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Uh, Ita, do we have about five minutes more or are we already out of time? Uh, I think the, I spoke to the other uh, panelists quickly on the WhatsApp and uh, they're so mesmerized by the conversation that I think you can take a few more minutes. They're enjoying it as much as I am. So please carry on. I, I, thank you. I'll try and uh, round this off because, you know, uh, one of the out uh, outcomes of our conflict transformation workshop was a book which was called, it is called Closer to Ourselves. I don't know if you can see it here. Um, yes, we can it, see it. It, it was here. It's got, it's got bits of Lahore and bits of uh, Delhi, and it appears like a new city on the hill. This was all premised on, on a very interesting kind of statement that uh, you know, John Lederach, who's considered to be, in a sense, the master of conflict transformation, had said at one point, and he'd said that to live between memory and potentiality is to live permanently in a creative space. This space is the womb of constructive change and the continuous birthplace of the past that lies before us. And what, a, what a, an amazing space. And we are actually struggling with that past, divided past, to try and make that leap into a shared future, which is something that the African uh, National Congress used that phrase very often in the anti-apartheid struggle. So I just wanted to, there are these two little um, bits that are shared. One is by Anupama Shekhar, who's an Indian who participated. And the other is, is actually by Seher Noon, who was a journalist from Lahore. Some of you might know her. And this is how it went. Anupama Shekhar said, a chance reading of Imtiaz Hussain uh, reminded me that Watan, because people talked about country and nation, Watan is nation, country, cannot be defined merely by the territory within which one claims rightful citizenship, but by the larger civilizational space uh, from which one draws imaginative strength. And this is how it came to be that seeking nightness in Lahore, in Asri, nightness in Amritsar, I tasted the dazzle of Lahore's dawn between my two states of home. And so earlier when Ekta talked about the fact that her family are in many of her, many members of Lahore or how 
uh, one of our panelists talked about Allahabad as resonating. This is what came out. And then there was Ambreen Seher Noon, who said the following. Life is a, set, is a series of journeys. Often the most revealing are those that bring us closer to ourselves. And that's what we named the book. My picture had flaws, but I still can't come to my identity. And one of the things that Women Peace Builders recognize is that we move in and out of identities and thank God for that. It's fluid, it's rich, it's changing. Um, it was easier returning to the shell, she said, even within the flag of our fathers, we had groups and divisions. But when we went to the table to talk, we put on a united national front. If they could quote numbers, we have the figures. If their story was clear, I, we surely could come up with one that made you howl. If that fail, we suffered at Searchin. Tit for tat, again and again. But for the first time, I looked at myself from the eyes of another. Another who was familiar, yet estranged, I experienced burning hospitality, open warmth, and shared history that for once in my life went beyond the 50 years that I was taught to believe in. India owned me up, and despite my resistance, I warmed to her people. I found something new about myself in India. I got on a rickshaw for the first time in my life and thought outside and beyond the dimension of my superimposed morals and education. It was strange finding emancipation in the heart of the enemy. Maybe it was just luck. Maybe my trip came at an opportune time. Maybe I had to face, face the demon of the other because, before I could face up to those in me. Maybe, maybe, a lot of maybe. But what she did say at the end was that with this constant people to people contact, even if through collaborative exploration, through de rehumanizing the other for a few more years, hopefully change will come. If not in our lifetime, at least we'll transmit alternative vocabulary to our children and our grandchildren. And there will be hope for our shared humanity. I thought this was a beautiful way to share with you what young people said to us over the past 15 years when we did the workshop, which Silla enriched her wisdom, her energy, and her learning. And I thank you all so much for this amazing opportunity. Silla, lots of love to you. Thank you. And let's meet again, my dear friend. We will. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Aikta, do you want to speak first? I might need a moment. Speak first. I might need a moment. <laughs> no, go ahead, Eva. I think uh, we've had a, a beautiful conversation between two amazing souls. And there's so much I've been taking notes. Uh, so this is going to go into my <laughs> into something that you'll see in EG very soon. Uh, but please carry on. We have some amazing panelists uh, waiting in the wings. And they have a lot of beautiful things to say. So please carry on. Lovely. Thank you. Wow. Silla Manakshi, profound conversation, profound conversation. Um, I, I also am just so appreciative of this moment in time when we all are coming from different parts of the world and get to sit in our living rooms with you and just take in this inspiring um experience that you all have. So thank you both so much for enriching and inspiring this summit. And um, yeah, and and may this be a seed, right? May it be a seed that then grows like your bean story, Scylla. <laughs> that, is, that is a metaphor I'm carrying with me. We're all planting our own beans and maybe grow them together um, into plants that really nourish and help us be stronger. So Thank you thank both. You. Thank you, thank you.